Next up to the stage, we have Luke Marsden, and I, I'm excited for this talk as well. Luke, how's everything? Yeah, doing great, thank you. It's uh, fun to be here. Absolutely, absolutely. Listen, I'll pass it over to you. You take it away. Cool. Um, go ahead and share my screen. So yeah, I love the idea of uh, having a DJ in an online conference. It's the first time I've seen that, and uh, yeah, that's that's awesome. So. Um, hi, everyone. I'm going to talk a little bit about GitOps for MLOps, um, and in particular, going beyond code and environment versioning, um, because what GitOps is all about is, is, is versioning your environment, versioning your uh, deployed operational artifacts in the same way that you version code. But actually, when you're doing MLOps, that's, that's not enough. And I'll, I'll talk about why that is, um, and then talk about some ideas about how we can uh, we can integrate the approaches. So I'll start by answering the question, what is MLOps? For people who aren't familiar with that term, um, it's really the intersection of three disciplines. Um, so it's the intersection of software engineering, uh, which we all know and love, um, DevOps, uh, which is, is pretty clear, hopefully, to, to the audience here, um, but also machine learning. So it's the idea of, of how do you operationalize um, your machine learning models. And, and in particular, when you talk about operationalizing machine learning, it means that you're bringing data into your kind of sphere of, of DevOps in a way that you weren't before. Um, production systems, production DevOps systems do operate um, on data. They operate um, on data in databases and, and key value stores and so on. But the thing that's unique and different about machine learning pulling data into that in a new way is that data is actually used to create the models that are deployed into production. It's not just that your production system is operating on data. So there's an important uh, distinction there um, that, are, that I'll talk about um, in a bit more detail. Um, so I like to think of it just in terms of these very simple functions, kind of like mathematical functions. Um, and it's worth also trying to answer the question, well, is, is MLOps just more DevOps or is it, or is it something different? Um, someone showed up in our Slack community, the MLOps Slack community a few weeks ago and said, uh, their, their opening salvo was MLOps is just more DevOps. <laughs> you don't even need a special community for it. Like, what are you talking about? Um, and that led to a very interesting and, and kind of heated debate ab about whether it is just more, just more DevOps. Um, well, let's look at it in terms of kind of the, the component pieces. So the, you can think of software as being a function of code and environment. In particular, it's the function is this compile function. So you've got some code, some software, um, and you compile it and you build it into a Docker image, and then you deploy it into production using tools like Flux. Um, Whereas ML models, like I said earlier, are a function of the data that they're trained on and the parameters that are used in, in training those models, as well as um, the code that's used to train the models and the environment. And so there's these new um, parameters in this function. Uh, data is an input to the deployed artifact, and that's just not the case um, in, uh, in regular software DevOps. And then there's also these parameters. And the parameters are kind of easier to keep track of. They're like learning rate or um, various other um, uh, tunables that, that you uh, tune when you're, when you're training models on data. Um, yeah, they're, they're kind of, they're easier to keep track of because they're smaller than, than the data itself, but they also need to be, to be kept track of. And then the function itself is also different. There's this compile function, which is different to the train function. Um, so compiling code um, is, is pretty deterministic and it's fairly fast. So CI systems can be slow, um, but it's nothing compared to, um, uh, to how slow it can be to train a model on a large data set. We're talking about minutes normally or seconds to compile software, whereas training can, can take hours or even days. So it's a substantially more um, uh, expensive, kind of computationally expensive process. Um, and it's also uh, sometimes non-deterministic. So when you, if you compile the same binary with the same code in the same environment with the same version of the compiler, 
you normally get the same binary. You certainly get sort of the, a functionally equivalent binary. There might be some timestamps in the binary that are different or something, but you effectively get functionally the same uh, thing. But um, when you are uh, training a model, um, that, that model training can be uh, non-deterministic. Um, and the, the training is sometimes even distributed. So this adds complexity. Um, also, uh, I'll talk about, I'll touch on monitoring and observability very briefly. So when you've got a model, like a machine learning model that's deployed in production, just looking at the latency and the error rates of that model um, is not sufficient. Obviously, it's important to do that. Um, your model kind of looks a bit like a microservice. It's an HTTP endpoint, typically, that you send it a picture and it says that's a cat or a dog or whatever the, the example might be of a, like an image classifier or something. But you can't just understand the behavior of that sort of microservice by, by looking at the latencies and error rates because you get these, uh, these problems of drift and the model um, being exposed to data that it, uh, that it wasn't trained on. Um, and, uh, and so you can have a model that is exposed to uh, data that has changed significantly um, versus the data it was trained on. And suddenly the, the model doesn't work anymore. It's, it's giving you completely haywire results. Um, but your monitoring system, if you're just looking at latencies and error rates, isn't sufficient um, to notice that. It will say everything is fine but everything will really not be fine. Um, and so there are statistical techniques which are kind of outside of the scope of this talk um, that you need to bear in mind when, uh, when you're doing MLOps as well in terms of the monitoring and observability side. Um, now I wanna talk about reproducibility and provenance a little bit because these are terms that come up a lot in kind of the ML space, but, um, but there's something that as DevOps people we take for granted. Um, so in DevOps in particular, we know where our deployed artifacts came from. Um, we know the history of the, the source code that went into creating them. You've almost always got a Git hash associated with a deployed container image that you can trace back to the exact Git hash or tag um, that's in your version control system. And then because compiling your software in a given container image is, is, um, is deterministic, you, you know where that came from. Like, that's all you need. You just need the, um, the code and the environment that it was, that it was trained in, and, and that's pretty much it. But, but imagine if you couldn't, imagine if you didn't have that strong link between your uh, deployed model, oh, sorry, your deployed software um, and the source code, the version of the source code that went into it. It would make it very, very difficult to debug your software if you didn't know what was running in production. Um, it would make it very difficult to keep track of your changes. Um, and it would make it difficult to fix things because if you can't isolate what's gone wrong when something goes wrong, then it's difficult to know um, if you fixed it. And so there is this additional complexity um, in, in ML, um, especially around reproducibility and provenance uh, because um, it's not just the uh, code that goes into training the model as we saw here. You've got these data and these, the, the data and the parameters as well. Um, and so you need to be keeping track of those things. You need to be versioning your data and versioning your parameters and versioning your training runs, um, just like you track the versions of the code that, that go into creating software um, in, in regular DevOps. And, and keeping track of the versions of data and the provenance of data is, is harder than, than doing it with source code. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about what this feels like when it goes wrong. Um, so lots of companies are playing with machine learning. They've got lots of data and they they think, oh, we might be able to create, um, uh, ge generate some business value from this data by, by training machine learning models and then deploying them to automate some aspect of our business. Um, but, but lots of people are trying and lots of people haven't taken in, haven't, they haven't fully understood this need for reproducibility and provenance. And they kind of end up doing, um, doing these, kind of anti-patterns, I guess you could call them. I mean, one of the biggest ones is just finding that teams just can't deploy models. Um, uh, I saw a tweet earlier that, that said that it took three, three weeks for someone to train a model and 11 months later, it still wasn't deployed. I think that was described as kind of the, the experience of enterprise machine learning. 
Um, and that can be uh, that can be caused by, for example, um, DevOps people not really understanding um, what is this what is this Jupyter notebook that your that your uh, machine learning person is giving me and so on. Um, there's then there's the problem of understanding model behavior once models have been deployed. Um, like I said earlier, that's harder to do uh, with with ML than it is um, uh, with regular software. And another symptom of uh, of this kind of done badly is if people are manually keeping track um, of the models that they've deployed or the, even the models that they've trained. Um, and so if you see anywhere that you've got a spreadsheet of machine learning models that a human is manually updating or a team of humans are manually updating, um, then that should be a red flag. Um, just, I mean, just think about it from the from the DevOps perspective. Imagine if my CI system or my continuous delivery system was a spreadsheet, and every time I built a, a, a piece of software that I wanted to deploy to production, um, imagine if I built that on my laptop, and then um, I uploaded it to the server, and then I made a record of the fact that I deployed it to production by uploading it manually to the server in my in my spreadsheet. This is how a lot of machine learning happens right now. Um, another pain point that we that, that I've seen a lot is is teams where knowledge is siloed in people's heads, and that means if one person leaves the building, uh, metaphorically speaking, these days, if if they if they leave the company, for example, they can leave with a lot of knowledge about that model in their heads, and and it's hard for other people in the team to pick it up. And another symptom of uh, of ML ops done badly is uh, is that everyone does things differently. If you see different people keeping track of their models um, in different ways and everyone having like their own like folder structure or spreadsheets or whatever that they've, that they've developed uh, to keep track of their work, um, then that, that should be another, an, another red flag. And all of this can kind of feel a lot like um, software engineering before version control. Um, uh, imagine like software engineering before version control and trying to manually integrate changes and emailing patch files around. It also feels a lot like DevOps before GitOps, uh, where people would manually deploy um, software or, or they'd, they'd have kind of inferior approaches to, to automatically deploying software. And they don't have that audit trail and that uh, history of, of what was deployed when and, and by whom. Um, so, so that's kind of what MLOps done badly looks like. Uh, and I just quickly want to go through some requirements that, that I've found are important. Um, if you can achieve these requirements in your MLOps system, then you can go a long way uh, to making it more sane. Um, that's reproducibility. You need to be able to, I need to be able to retrain someone else's model from nine months ago and get it to within the same few percentage points of accuracy. That means I need to be able to retrain it with the same version of TensorFlow they used on the same data set that they used, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Models have to be held accountable, which means that you need to be able to kind of hold them accountable for their decision making. In particular, that means um, that you need to be able to trace back from a model that's running in production to where it came from. Uh, you need a system that enables collaboration. So you need to be able to do asynchronous collaboration, which is something that DevOps and software teams take for granted, but with large data sets and so on, it can be harder uh, to do this. And then finally, you need a continuous process. Um, where you can deploy automatically through a CI CD system and then monitor those models um, statistically, like, like I mentioned. Um, and this diagram can help kind of highlight the, the difference here um, and some of the challenges. Um, so in particular, with software and DevOps, you've got this fairly straightforward loop um, of you write this some code, you test it, you deploy it, you monitor it, and then you go back around the loop. Um, Whereas with machine learning and MLOps, you've got much more complexity. You've got data coming into the system. You've got feature engineering that happens on data. Um, you've got the code that trains the models. You've got the parameters. And these all feed into uh, what we call model runs um, and data runs, which is this notion that if you track, if you version the execution of your data engineering script against the input data, and you version the input data, and you version the output data, um, you're, you're versioning the execution of code against data rather than just specific versions of code in, as points in time. And so there's this whole like world of, of run tracking. Um, and, and you should look at tools like MLflow, for example, to, to keep track of the executions of uh, your 
uh, of your code against um, a certain input data and, out and generating output data. And then similarly, you have these model runs, which is when you're executing a model training script. This is the train function from earlier. Um, that's reading in the data, uh, running the code and the parameters to generate models uh, with certain metrics that are then deployed um, into production uh, and monitored. So, um, so my answer to the question, is MLOps just more DevOps, is, is yes, it is. But the DevOps and GitOps teams are going to have to level up to handle this extra complexity. Um, and it's worth learning how to tackle these problems. Otherwise, the data science and ML teams you serve will end up in, frankly, a right mess. Um, and it's important to think carefully about how you add data to this equation, um, because doing reproducible data-driven pipelines in the right way is, is hard, and it's worth serious attention and focus. Um, and I always point to Pachyderm, which is an open source uh, data pipelining uh, tool for a good example of doing this right. So take a look at the Pachyderm data model um, for how to version uh, and keep track of provenance for, uh, for the data side of this equation. Um, so I know I've only got one minute left, but I, I want to tie this into GitOps um, here uh, with two, um, two separate pieces. The first piece is around deployment. So how can we extend, do we need to extend GitOps tools like Flux uh, to work with this MLOps workflow the, that I've described? Um, I think we do. I, I think there are some specific challenges that we should try and address as a community. Um, there's uh, the first challenge that I've seen is, is deploying containerized models, because there's basically there's two ways that people deploy containerized models. Um, the first one uh, is that they bake the model files themselves, which can be a few hundred meg, um, into the Docker image. And then they deploy the Docker image that has the model and also the model serving code, like uh, TensorFlow serving or uh, the PyTorch model server or whatever it is that they're using. And in this scenario, uh, things work just fine using Flux because Flux is used to seeing a new um, image show up in a, uh, in a container registry and automatically takes care of the rest. But there's this problem, which is actually a more common uh, technique for, um, for doing uh, deployment of models, is that you've got a generic Docker image, like a TensorFlow serving container. And that pulls a model from object storage when it starts up, based on a, an environment variable that says, pull this version of the model. And it, actually, to redeploy this, we need to deploy the same Docker image, just with a new parameter, with a new environment variable. And the trigger for those deploys are when new models show up in S3 buckets. Um, so I think that supporting redeploying based on new models showing up in object storage would require changes to Flux. And I think that might be quite an interesting uh, project. It might be quite an interesting thing to try. And then the other thing I'll say is um, this idea of provenance. Uh, I'll probably just go one minute over. I think this is my last slide. So um, the GitOps uh, record in Git um, needs to uh, it needs to keep track of more than just the the version of the code that trained the model. It also needs to have this provenance record back from um, the version of the model that's running in production to the code that was used to train it, but also um, what data was used to train that model, what parameters was that model trained with, and then where did that data come from, which is kind of a graph structure of uh, data engineering steps that went into creating the training set that that model was trained on. And this is, this is really the MLOps equivalent of being able to see which Git commit led to a certain microservice being deployed. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to shout out that, that I'm open to, to collaborating with folks. I'd love feedback from, from the audience um, and uh, open to collaborating with folks building and using GitOps tools uh, to start making them work better in MLOps uh, scenarios. Um, so there are some shameless plugs. Uh, there's a, a community uh, that I'm a member of called MLOps.community, which is open. We, we do weekly online meetups. Um, so if you're interested in MLOps and GitOps, please come and show up uh, and, uh, and get involved. Um, and also I do consulting, um, but you need that. So uh, yeah, thank you.